my name is Jeffrey Robins, and I'm Editorial Development Manager at Nature Research. I have my PhD in pharmacology, but I conducted research in biochemistry, neuroscience, and tissue engineering. Yes, I have a lot of background in biomedical research, clinical research, so it's an absolute pleasure to be here. Conducting the workshops in the museum was an excellent opportunity to see about the history of Sechenoff University. So of course Nature Research is one of the main goals is for publishing top journals across different disciplines. My particular role is to try to improve the quality of the research that's being done and we do so by developing and conducting training workshops to work directly with researchers face to face and to help them give them the advice and the foundation necessary to do that. Well, we're doing more and more workshops um, every year. This year, I think we've conducted over 80 workshops worldwide in maybe about 20 different countries. And in terms of tailoring, we do tailor the workshops, um, not just only for countries, but also for the universities. I've been to Russia many times. Uh, this is, I believe, my fourth or fifth time to Moscow. I've been to St. Petersburg, to Tomsk, Ekaterinburg. However, this is my first time to do a workshop in biomedical or medical sciences. The majority of what I've done previously were physical sciences, which is, a, I think, a strength in Russia in terms of physics and other aspects in those areas. So for me, it's an excellent opportunity to be able to work with people more related to my own discipline. I think the, the people that joined the workshops were us here for three days in terms of their uh, eagerness and their motivation was absolutely fantastic. They had a lot of questions about publishing, a lot of questions about improving the quality of the research. So I think it was a great mix of my expertise and my expectations as well as theirs. In Russia, I think in terms of publishing in international journals, this is something that's more uh, recent for them. So they have a lot of uh, Russian journals that I think a lot of people are more used to publishing in. And then to be able to change the mindset to increase their likelihood that international editors would want to publish their research is probably one of the larger challenges that many of them are facing. Well, I think different journals will have different interests in terms of their levels of novelty or impact they expect, or the breadth in terms of interest for single discipline or multiple disciplines. But one commonality that I think all journals have is they will expect that it will be a robust, uh, reproducible study design with reliable, accurate data that supports the conclusions in the paper. I think one of the main issues I've seen in a lot of the Russian papers that I've evaluated from Russian scientists is the tendency to not be very concise and very direct. They tend to talk a bit too broadly about research topics and using very long sentences and describing those topics and having that lack of conciseness and clarity I think can impact negatively how those papers are received. They try to showcase all of their knowledge related to that topic but unfortunately it works against them because it looks like they can't be focused enough to really highlight the value of this individual research project they're trying to publish. I would say by far the good research, quality research. The language can always be improved at a later point. If you don't have a good topic, good research data, good analyses, and a strong conclusion, regardless of how well it's written, it will never get published. What I always recommend for attendees of these workshops is that they should take every rejection they receive as a learning experience. Try to understand why it was rejected, how could you avoid that the next time, Try to improve your manuscript based on the comments you receive and you then may have a good chance to be able to get it published in your next choice journal. While everybody gets rejected, even the highest quality and most respectable scientists will get rejected from journals. I think what's important is don't take it personal. They're not saying you're a bad researcher, you're a bad scientist. They're simply saying this study is not appropriate for my journal right now. By understanding what was the rationale and how could you avoid that the next time, the success will increase every single time. Never give up. Give your papers to colleagues that are not familiar with your research and ask them, is this something you would want to read? If not, why? And if they have any issues, those are likely going to be problems reviewers are going to have as well. 
So if you can fix that before you submit to the journal, it can hopefully help you get through the peer review process a lot more smoothly. But if I was going to give maybe like three key advices, one, you'd really need to highlight what is the important problem in the field that is hindering the field's advancement. That helps to establish your subject expertise, which is going to be important. Second, to have a good, strong study design to address that problem. That helps to establish technical expertise and credibility, which is necessary as well. And then to really ensure that the implications or the recommendations of your research are going to be tailored specifically for the journal you want to publish in, because that's what editors are looking for. That's the basic standard to get published. If you want to take it to the next level, high impact journals, nature, science, etc. Why the reason they're high impact is they publish striking breakthroughs that have broad applications in the field. And so you need to really convince that editor you have a fundamental advance that's really changing the way that we're starting to think or be able to address a certain problem in the field. And that's not as easy to do. Sometimes people have a strategy, they submit it to a high impact journal, if it gets rejected, then they go down. But I say first try to understand why it was rejected by your first journal, especially if it went through peer review because they're going to highlight what were the flaws, what were the issues, and if you address those problems, if you address all of those concerns those editors or reviewers had, you may be improving the quality of the study and the paper. And maybe now you can even submit it to even a higher impact factor journal um, in, the next, in the second round. So I think again, taking the, this as a learning experience, understanding what were the problems, addressing those problems, is going to help improve the publication success. One thing I'd say, a word of warning with that type, is the quality of the peer review is often quite correlational to the impact factor of the journal. It means high impact factor journals find it relatively easy to find high quality reviewers, which means as an author, you're going to get much better advice. Lower quality or lower impact factor journals have a lot of difficulties in finding reviewers, and they may be choosing people that don't really have the subject or technical expertise that will give you the important information that you need. So it is, there is going to be a, ver a variety or variability of the type of advice you would get. Basically violating any ethical guidelines was usually almost immediate grounds for blacklisting. If they feel that you're not treating participants in your studies in, in a proper way with a declaration of Helsinki, you're not going through the ethics committee approval, all these aspects which editors feel are incredibly important for highly reproducible and ethical research is, could be immediate grounds for blacklisting. It doesn't mean you'll be on the blacklist forever. However, you'll need to prove over time that you've no longer, uh, you are now adhering to these international guidelines that, w a that editors would expect. I think this will often depend on the, I uh, guess, quality of the journal. So well, rep, uh, kind of high impact journals often use professional editors who have a lot of training on how to evaluate the quality of research. Those tend to have a tendency not to be as biased towards big names because they understand just because you're a big name doesn't mean all the research is going to be impactful. However, other journals, especially maybe with newer editors, they have, may have a tendency to be more influenced by the name recognition or prestige of certain institutions or certain people. So I think it would also depend on the type of journal you're going to submit to. Especially problematic for uh, newer journals or journals that do not really have impact factors yet. They have such a difficult time in attracting reputable authors that brings a lot of name recognition to this maybe relatively unknown journal. So I think that's where you're going to see that skew towards trying to get you know, publishing these international reputable authors. But for already established journals, they have that reputation already. So that, that urge to get these prestigious authors is no longer such a, a major criteria that they have. It's important to understand how plagiarism is detected. It goes through a two-step process. The first is a kind of a quantitative analysis in terms of similarity. So a journal editors put the manuscript through a software and it gets a similarity report. Then it goes through a subjective evaluation where the editor will look at the similarity report and make a subjective analysis. Is this really plagiarism or is this just a common way to describe this idea? What I usually recommend, so what, to avoid potential plagiarism, is to decrease similarity. 
And what I often recommend non-native English speakers to do, and this is something I'm not able to do, is if they want to communicate an idea that's been already been published and decrease similarity, is when they take notes, is maybe take the notes in Russian. And then when they write the paper in English, they're translating back from Russian into English. It's the same core idea being described, but going through this translation step, the similarity between the two will be very low. And that's an easy way to avoid uh, any potential flags for plagiarism. The important thing I always try to emphasize when I work with these workshops and attendees is I always recommend that authors need to learn to take a step back from their research, see the larger picture, and really understand what is the valuable contribution their research is really having. And I often test uh, uh, attendees to ask them, why does your research matter? When you understand the true value your research has for the field, that really becomes the core um, thesis of the actual manuscript. And that's what you're trying to convince editors, reviewers, peers in your field, that your research is important, it is making a valuable contribution in some way. And once you've been able to identify what that valuable contribution is, that becomes the central focus of the paper, and hopefully will convince that those you know, core beneficiaries agree with you, yes, your research does matter. Editors are very keen on publishing papers that they feel are going to be useful for the field now. Those that will be well, you know, highly downloaded, widely cited. But that means that some papers that are going to be very interesting may not get published because the editor does not see them to be the current trends in the field. And so therefore it may skew how the field develops over time. But on that said, that's actually one of the key reasons why something called mega journals, things like Plus One, scientific reports, why they were established is to be able just to publish research based on the quality of the, of the study design, the reproducibility of the findings, not concerning impact, novelty, or importance. Let it get published, and then after publication, let the field itself decide, is this research going to be valuable or not? I'd say there's two things that uh, authors should always look for. One is the quality of the peer review of that journal. And how they can assess that is by looking at recently published articles in the journal. Do they notice common mistakes? Are there flaws? If they are, that suggests that journal is not really using good quality peer review, which means A, the journal itself is probably not that great of a journal, but also means as an author, if you submit to that journal, you're not going to get the advice you deserve to get to improve the quality of your work. And I think one of the things that uh, every author should be looking for is to ensure that that journal is indexed in databases that the readers in the field use to find papers. Because if you get published in a journal, regardless of how good it is, if nobody finds your paper because it's not indexed in the databases people use, then no one will ever read it. So I think that discoverability issue is going to be a really a critical factor that authors need to keep in mind. I think with these kind of predatory journals or these illegitimate journals, I always tell attendees that there's three key factors I always recommend to look for. Firstly, if a journal is indexed in Web of Science, Medline, and Scopus, these databases use independent committees to evaluate a journal. It is very difficult to get included. So if you see a journal indexed in all three of those databases, you can feel quite confident it's probably a good journal. Second is to look, is it being published by a reputable publisher? If it is published by a reputable publisher like Springer Nature, Elsevier, Wiley, you can probably feel confident it's going to be a good journal. And then the third is in terms of the fees you have to pay. If they ask for a submission fee, that's usually an indicator, uh, it may be an illegitimate journal. For open access journals, you don't pay until after the peer review process, until after your paper's been accepted. So asking for fees up ahead of, uh, in advance is usually a good red flag. Writer's block is a problem for everyone. I think what's important when you're writing a paper is to try to break down your paper into smaller steps. I think the writer's block is when you're thinking, oh my gosh, I need to write a 4,000 word manuscript. So what I usually recommend for authors to do is first just focus on writing an outline. Just organize all the ideas, all the concepts you want to use as a bullet point list. It's usually easy to do and it lets you focus and linearly organize what you want to describe. Once you have that done, 
then when you start writing the paper, is just to focus on one section at a time. Don't think about writing the entire manuscript. Just think on writing, I'm going to write the introduction. And then I'll write the methods. And just focus section by section. And it helps to reduce the stress level, because I think it's the stress that causes that writer's block. And being more focused can also help ensure you're going to communicate your ideas more clearly as well. I think there's two important aspects to that question. First, well-trained, experienced editors are, uh, are able to identify either positive or negative biases in peer review. That's why they use three reviewers, because if one of them differs so, you know, so much from the other two, an editor can now see whether or not this reviewer was positively biased, maybe a colleague or a friend, or negatively biased as a competitor. And if that is the case, they may discard that reviewer from the evaluation of the manuscript and find another reviewer instead. So at least, I would say, more uh, qualified or experienced editors are quite good at detecting that. That said, if an author is aware that someone may be potentially biased against their work or not qualified technically to evaluate the paper, we always encourage them, let the editor know and that we recommend that these you know, researchers should be excluded because of potential conflict of interest or lack with the technical expertise related to my research that will not give it a good quality peer review. Probably the most important thing in terms of conflicts of interest is first to be as transparent as possible. If you are aware that there could be any perceived conflict of interest, even if it's not real, it's best to highlight that as soon as possible to the editor in a cover letter, explain that this could be a perceived as a conflict of interest, but it is not for these reasons, and to outline it. I think being as upfront and as transparent as possible, not, let, not waiting till the reviewers identify a potential conflict of interest, because then it looks like the authors were trying to hide it. So I think the more upfront, the more transparent you are, it will allow the editor to feel more confident that this research was conducted objectively and as fairly as possible. A lot of Russian scientists are publishing quite often in Russian journals. I think they need to get that confidence that their research is at the quality, the world standard that's necessary to get published in international journals. They need to get that confidence to make, to make that effort to write the papers in English, publish the papers in English, and I think what they're going to find that they'll be able to achieve those goals and they'll build the reputation as well as the reputation of Sessionoff University. Mm -hmm.